And I'm a huge fan of your work. And it's clear that you uh, just have a passion for movies and all different kinds of stories. But I'm curious for you as a storyteller and as a filmmaker, did you always love movies as a kid? Was that something that you were into from a very young age or did that kind of come a little bit later? Uh, no, I was always hugely into films. I, I, you know, it started really, my love of film started with hammer horror films, really. I was obsessed with, I was, obs back then you could not, you didn't have a video, forget video stores, you didn't have streaming. There was no way to see a film when you wanted to see it. So I would pick up copies of TV Guide and basically circle all the films that I wanted to see that week that were playing. Even if they were playing at 1.30 in the morning, I would sneak out of bed and watch it. And Horror of Dracula became a, le a legendary film for me. For some reason, they never screamed, but I had heard about it. So when I finally got to see Horror of Dracula, I, I was, became obsessed with Hammer Horror Films. And that started the love of it. And I was 10 years old at the time. And Dracula Has Risen from the Grave came to our local theater. So another Christopher Lee Hammer Dracula. So I got to see that. And there are so many magical moments I have connected to being in a movie theater that it just fueled my passion. Again, I love movies at that age, never thinking, you know, I grew up in a factory town in Ohio. So I, my, both of my parents were factory workers and the concept of me, when I said I wanted to go to film school, that was just like, that's the most ridiculous thing any of my family had ever heard of, except for my parents who supported the, weirdly supported this maniac's idea of going to film school, you know, because I knew if I failed at film school, if I did, if things did not work out, I was going back to Ohio and I'd be working next to my father in this Alcan aluminum factory. So um, that, yeah, it was a love of film that fueled all of this. Well, that, that kind of goes into my next question, which was, you know, obviously Gremlins is the thing that brought you to prominence. And I was rewatching it. That's a Gremlins poster behind me. Oh, course, where it's, always, it's always on the wall here. I didn't plan this. Um, uh, but I was rewatching the, the first movie recently, and it's a really gnarly movie. And if I'm not mistaken, your original script was even darker than what made it to the screen. Is that right? Yeah, it was. Grem the original Gremlin script was, I, I was living in New York at the time with these uh, mice running around the floor and I was watching old, old universal horror films on PBS. And my friend said to me, you know, you should write them. You love monster. He called it, a mo you love monster movies so much. Why don't you write a monster movie? And I was thinking about these mice running around at night and my thing, you know, they would scurry by my finger if my hand was draped over the bed. It was really creeping me out. And that's where I came up with the idea of a gremlin. So I wrote it as a straightforward horror film, uh, hard R, uh, mom's head comes rolling down the stairs, you know, the kids, uh, that Billy and Kate go into uh, a McDonald's and all of the, none of the food is eaten, but all of the people are eaten. Uh, so it was, it was very, uh, it was very dark. And uh, I, my agent sent it out to about 50 producers and only, only the luck, you know, I, I was going to do a movie with Paul Newman at one point, And he said to me, you know, this business is, 50% talent and 50% luck. And the lucky part of Gremlins is Steven Spielberg was leaving his office and he just glanced to his assistant's desk and he saw the title. And he was like, that was an interesting title. So he picked it up and read it over the weekend and I got a call from him like three days later. So that's how Gremlins happened. So it was very, and then Steven, Steven was very instrumental because I was a young writer and I was, you know, I was like a kid in the candy store getting to work with Steven Spielberg. And he was, he steered me into, he, he said, you know, this needs to reach a wider audience. He goes, what you've done could be great, but it's an R rated horror film. He goes, but there's a way that what you've written can reach a much wider audience. So we worked on several drafts of the script. Is Gremlins 3 something that's still happening? Is it, I mean, and here you talk, like that sounds like something that would be fun as like a Blumhouse, like a really gritty, like, just hard R-rated Gremlin sequel. Yeah, I would love to do it. I mean, there's a script. I wrote a script, so there is a, is an exist, existing script. Um, we're working out some rights issues right now, so we're just trying to figure out uh, when the best time to make that film would be. We would do it as a, you know, I would still do it the same way. I would do it as a, you know, a tangible puppets, not CGI. Yeah. You know, maybe having. 
you know, we had one stop motion scene in the film, but in the first Gremlins, but uh, yeah, I don't think I'd, I'd use much CGI in Gremlins. I'd love to see that. I really hope it happens. I do um, too. <laughs> I want to talk about Home Alone, but I first wanted to ask you about your relationship with John Hughes, because you guys worked together on a number of films and, you know, as a, an aficionado of, of, you know, John Hughes films myself, it's clear that he had a, a unique relationship with kind of a lot of his closest collaborators. And I was wondering what your guys' relationship was, um, or was like together. Uh, well, I, I put a tremendous amount of trust in John. You know, John, really, once he handed off Home Alone to me as a director, he came to the set once. He came to the Home Alone set one time, visited, you know, I, we were shooting 10 minutes from his house, but John was a night owl and he liked to write all night long. You know, he would write from 11 at night to six in the morning. And he just loved writing. I think he sometimes loved writing more than directing, but once he saw where Home Alone was going on the first day, he seemed to, he handed me the reins. So we would talk every now and then when he, he would see dailies, but um, it was a good, it was a great relationship because we did three films together, but he was very hands off, you know. Uh, Home Alone 2, he came to the set the first day. Again, we were shooting in New York and um, that was it. He just let me do my thing. So that was, that was the great thing about John is he was extremely supportive. Uh, I mean, and that must be a gift to just be handed a John Hughes script and it's like, do what you want with it. Like, I trust you. Go well, the gift was, look, 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 the reality is that the gift was that John sent me Christmas vacation. Yeah. And I was scheduled to do that. And uh, I think a lot of people know my relationship with Chevy Chase was not particularly great. And I didn't want to, I needed a Christmas vacation more than anything because I thought my last film had flopped miserably. And I thought, this is it. I'm never going to direct again. And John sent me Christmas vacation. So that was very difficult to walk away from because I, you know, I could have been walking away from a, a, a directing career. Uh, shockingly, he sent me home alone two, two weeks later. I mean, he, so I thought he's never going to send me anything again because I put him in this situation where I walked away from him and a huge star, but he sent me home alone. And I'm actually quite glad he did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, I mean, you knocked it out of the park and something that's really prevalent in a lot of your films is I feel like you have a really like a knack for world building. And even in Home Alone, the way you use the camera to to show the geography of the house that you're going to need to know later when all the stunts are happening to make sure everything makes sense. Is that something that, you know, is world building something that you um, have a lot of passion for? Is it something that comes naturally? Is it something really important to you? It, uh, I mean, it does. I mean, for me, it's a matter of it's the specificity of telling a story. And if you tell the story in a sloppy way, the audience is not gonna get it. So you have to be very specific. And it's just, as you're telling a story, it's like telling a kid a bedtime story. When you're, when you're sitting there, you don't wanna leave anything out. You wanna make sure it's absolutely uh, understandable. And so world building for me is, you know, particularly on something like Potter, you know, it was like, the ability to create that world for the first three movies, basically, you know, we, we, we produced the third one, but that world was then in place for the three subsequent directors who came in to do the film. And that is one of the things I'm the most proud of. The fact that when I first met JK Rowling, she said to me, we met for three, I got the job from Warner brothers with one caveat. She had to approve me. Uh, so I flew to Scotland and met with her and she said, what's your vision for the movie? And we spent three hours discussing what that vision would be. And she said, I completely agree with it. We're in perfect sync. And that's when I felt now I can get to work. Now I can create along with my production designer and a team of talented artists, we can create Hogwarts. We can create the wizarding world with a real integrity of what it should feel like, you know, not something silly and goofy. I think that's one of the best film adaptations of any book ever, that entire franchise. And I think something that sometimes, I mean, as you said, like you were there at the beginning, you built that world, you hired Stuart Craig, you hired those actors. If any of those things were wrong, I don't think that series would have had the longevity or um, been as great as it was. But I'm curious from your perspective, I mean, obviously the book was hugely popular. You have Stuart Craig, you're looking at these brilliant sets, you're watching these actors, which I know you've said was kind of tough when they were young. 
you had trouble getting wide shots with them all like not cracking up and stuff. Right. Um, but when did you know, when did you feel like you had it? Was it, was it a very like uh, post-production intensive film? Was there a lot of editing and then you're like, okay, this is coming together or was it on set? Did you feel like you got it? But the reality is the pressure of the, of the world was on us, you know, on me particularly. Cause I knew if I, again, if I screwed this one up, it's over, it's all yeah. over. You can't screw up this book. So I had to go to the set every day with sort of tunnel vision in terms of not thinking about the outside world. And that was a little easier 19 years ago before the internet uh, blew up. But it's, it's, it was, the first film was fraught with anxiety for me because I thought first two weeks, I thought I was gonna get fired every day. I mean, everything looked good. I just thought why, you know, I could, if I do one thing wrong, if I fuck up, I'm fired. And that was, that was intense. And I didn't let any of that show on the set. There was no frustration. I don't, I'm not a screamer. I don't, I get along with everybody and I want everybody to feel like they're part of the family. So I just had to hide that side of my emotions. Uh, by the time we finished the first film and then we screened it in Chicago, we always, it's good luck for us to screen our films in Chicago. So back in the day, we would always, when we could go to a movie theater, we would fly <laughs> to Chicago and show the film to an audience. And the audience loved it. I mean, the audience just ate up the film. The, the film was two hours and 50 minutes long at that point. And the kids thought it was too short. The parents said it was too long. Uh, so I started to feel a little relief. And then when the first movie opened well, I was, I, I, I had so much more fun on Chamber of Secrets. It was like night and day. Cause then I could really let loose a little bit and do and bring a little more of, you know, my particular style to the movie. I mean, that was a very specific um, choice, the style of the first Potter movie, but yeah. part of it we were boxed into because as I said, we had three cameras on the kids all the time. So you never <laughs> knew they were brand new. They had never been on movie sets. So they would say a line and then look into the camera and smile, or they would, uh, and they, the first week they were just so delighted that they were in Harry Potter. It meant the world to them. <laughs> they would just be smiling and like, like they were in a trance. So that was, that was something we had to overcome as well. Well, and on the second one, you know, I, I feel like you really, I like that you changed the style uh, visually and kind of the visual language of the series. And that's something that went on through the other films. But I was curious kind of what your, uh, what your process is, what your collaboration is with your DP and your cinematographer and kind of creating the visual language of, of these worlds. Uh, it's very intense. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's very specific. We, we sit with our storyboards and our script and we go through, through everything in a painstaking way. On Chronicles 2 just now, we, we have two very huge, three very big sets. One is Santa's Village. One is uh, a forest and the other is the reindeer stables. And we actually, you know, we build huge models of those sets. And then my cinematographer and myself take a, a pen camera and basically we go, we write out our shot list with me steering the camera, showing him exactly where I want to go. And then together we formulate a shot list and then we go through the script and talk about the look of the film the feeling of the film and get into great detail before you hit the set. So, you know, you know, when you hit the set running, you know exactly what you need to do. I'm a huge fan of your Potter films. I'm also a huge fan of what Alfonso did with Azkaban, but I know you were exhausted. I think the, the first movie opened while you guys were shooting the second one, right? So like you were still, you were just hustling and bustling, right? Um, we were, they were Potter. back to back. I think we were yeah. probably, yeah, because we were, shooting second unit for the second movie on 9-11. That's what I remember, shooting the flying car sequence uh, when we got word of the two towers coming down. Yeah. So um, we stopped shooting. Um, so yeah, so we were, that was, we, we, we wanted to get a lot of second unit done and then we had to take a hiatus to do press for uh, the first film as well. Well, I was curious, you know, if you if you ever wanted to go back, you know, as as that saga was going, once you were recharged, were you eager to kind of tackle uh, some of the other stories where the kids were adults? Well, I, you know, there was a point where I think um, after Mike Newell, it didn't see it didn't appear that David Yates was going to leave. So there was no real way for me to get. I mean, I always there's no question. 
I always wanted to go back and shoot the final, well, the final two movies. Um, but Yates, he just, he decided he was going to stay with the series. And it was a great thing to do because I, I particularly love the very last movie. Yeah. I really, I, I think that is just a brilliant film. The second, the second part of Deathly Hallows. Yeah, it's really operatic almost. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, before I get into Santa Chronicles, uh, I mean, um, with Home Alone, the stunts are insane. And I know everyone always talks about the stunts being insane, but like every time I rewatch it, it's very funny, but also just bone crushing what is happening to Harry and Marv. And I was curious, especially in Home Alone 2, um, it feels like, did you guys have any debate over like what's realistic versus what is cartoony? I mean, it's never not funny, but these guys would just be demolished after everything that happens to them. Well, look, I think Home Alone 2, to be quite honest, is basically a remake of Home Alone 1, you know, and I've, I learned from that, that, you know, if you're going to do a sequel to something like Chronicles, you make the sequel completely different in a, in a big way. Um, but some of the stunts in Home Alone 2 really make me laugh hard. I got to be honest with you. I, I just, I, they may, some of them make me laugh a little harder than the stunts in Home Alone 1, although Home Alone, The Home Alone is a better film. But that being said, when we shot those stunts, they were done without wires, without CGI, without any of that. We had two really tough stuntmen, but we'd shoot them. Uh, and then I yell cut and there was total silence from the crew because you would think that the stunt performer was dead. I mean, and it, was, it wasn't funny at all. And I'd walk up and I'd say, are you okay? And he'd brush himself off and say, yeah, do you want another one? And I was <laughs> stunned. This guy named Troy Brown, he took the worst of it. Then we'd go back to the monitor and look at the replay and we were laughing hysterically. So yeah. I don't know, I, I, maybe somebody is still doing, I mean, Tom Cruise is doing his own stunts, but I, yeah. I don't know if anybody else is doing those kind of bone crushing stunts anymore well even you look at you think now like with joe pesci and the fire on his head you think they replaced that with like cg and it's just not as effective it's not as it's not as funny <laughs> no we made a hat we made a hat that was on fire i literally on fire out of ceramic <laughs> for his head. <laughs> that's incredible um i did want to uh you know talk about christmas chronicles too which is tons of fun uh i really enjoyed it i was happy to see you back in christmas mode um, and really curious, you know, you produced the first film, but it was curious what drew you to co-writing and directing this one and kind of really um, kind of take creative charge. Well, I hit it off with, I mean, on the first movie, I was there every day as a producer and I just hit, uh, hit it off with Kurt Russell. I mean, we just became really close and loved, even as a, from a producerial standpoint, standpoint, love working together. So... Once Chronicles 1 came out and it reached this, a, a big audience, Netflix wanted to do a second one. And Kurt and I, you know, we met and had a couple of beers. And I was like, you know what? Um, how do you want to, if we do a second one, I don't want to repeat the first one. You know, I don't want it Home Alone 2. I said, I want to do, I want to open up the world. And Kurt said, yeah, let's open up the mythology of Santa Claus. Let's treat it with the integrity and respect it deserves. Don't treat it as a cheesy Santa Claus. I'm not a huge fan of holiday movies, but I gave Christmas Chronicles 2 sort of the same respect that I gave Harry Potter. I really wanted Santa's Village to look as it's like something you've never seen before. I wanted the Aurora Borealis in the North Pole to feel epic and big. And then Kurt went off and wrote like 200 pages of, of the backstory of Santa Claus, his <laughs> mythology. And so it was, he treated this role as if he were a method actor. I mean, I swear to God, he's obsessed with playing the role the way he plays it. And that's why he's so good in the role. He's so good. He's just like, you know, it's a Santa Claus you've never seen before. And it can get goofy or silly really quickly or cheesy and you don't want to go there. So that was the goal of Chronicles too, is opening up this world. And it's a completely different movie than part one because the scope is so much more massive. And part one was basically a night, out, which was a fun movie and we got to see Kurt for the first time, basically a night on the town in Chicago with Santa Claus. And it's, it's more of a comedy, I think. I think the first Christmas Chronicles is more of a comedy, but this is more of an action adventure fantasy film. 
it's so funny because I remember that first movie came out and I was like, oh, it's Kurt Russell as Santa Claus. And then I watched it and I was like, it's Kurt Russell as Santa Claus. Like, <laughs> this really weird. Like, you think like, oh, that's kind of funny. And then you watch it and like, ah, oh, he's so cool. Yeah, he he's like, so it's cool. insane because I, you know, I have to uh, tip my hat to my son because we were, my son's a screenwriter out here and he's, uh, he, he and I were working on a script together called St. Nick. This is before Christmas Chronicles. Mm-hmm. And um, it was basically a, for Kurt Russell as, as a kind of a superhero Santa Claus in modern day. Uh, and then I got, we got the script in for Chronicles. Santa Claus was only in it for like 10 to 12 pages. So I said to my son, I got to take some of the stuff we used in St. Nick and we have to move it over to Christmas Chronicles. This is the Santa Claus we need in Christmas Chronicles. So... <laughs> That's, and then Kurt, you know, Kurt's notorious for saying no to everything. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't, you know, he works with a handful of directors and he says, he, he just says no. And he said yes to us. So that it created the beginning of a beautiful relationship. So we worked on the script for about four months, five months together. Every night before we shot, Kurt and I would rewrite the next day's scene. You know, it was, re- it was really an intensely close collaboration. Well, you mentioned the the Santa's Village set, and it reminded me exactly of uh, your first Harry Potter film and visiting Diagon Alley for the first time. Uh, what was that like to kind of build that out? And again, your knack for world building, but also setting up this geography that's going to pay off later on in the film. Um, you know, approaching you know where you're pointing the camera and how you're setting all this up. Uh, were you using drones? Was that something you storyboarded and put together? No, we did a we you know we weren't as elaborate or as intensive as 1917, but we basically for the first shot of Santa's village, where you come over the village for the first time and then Santa and Mrs. Claus are walking forward. That was on a, that was on kind of a wire that you, the way you, they shoot professional football games these days. So we're on one of those cams and that it's a steady cam. And just as it gets to the point where Santa and Mrs. Claus are coming around the corner, we, the crew takes the steady cam off the camera and then start to walk back with them. It's what it's exactly what they did, but on a much bigger scale in 1917. Um, but yeah, all of that is, is mapped out beforehand. And, you know, I just was, I, I was hopeful. It was like taking, I wanted to say to the audience and particularly the children are going to see this movie. So you take my hand, come into this world and lose yourself in it. And that was the goal. Uh, I would say mission accomplished on that part because oh, it's, it's a delight. Thank <laughs> it's you. really a delight to get in there. Um, I have to ask you, I, I won't spoil exactly how it happens, but there is, there does appear to be a Home Alone homage in the film. And there is a dance number that involves Darlene Love. I was wondering where that came from and what that was like to shoot because that was just a blast to watch. One of my best friends in this, in this business, a guy named Steve Van Zant, who plays guitar with Bruce... Springsteen, and uh, he's he's been music supervisor on some films I've produced, and uh, most notoriously Home Alone 2, where Darlene Love, we reunited the E Street Band because Bruce had like gone off and done something else. And so we, we did a song called All Alone on Christmas, which is one of the best things that came out of that particular film. And so uh, Steve did a song for Christmas Chronicles 1, where he and the Disciples of Soul played an Elvis song. They were the backup band for Kurt in that scene. And I said, I want to do, you know, for me, it's like the Marx Brothers. I said, I I know I'm not making a Marx Brothers movie, but one of the joys of my favorite Marx Brothers films are when uh, Chico plays the piano and Harpo plays the harp. I love musical interludes. I just love them. And I said, the fact that Kurt has to get Christmas spirit up, a musical number is perfect. So I called Steve and I asked him to write a song for the sequence. And the Home Alone homage was actually not as... It, it hit me on the set. It was very subconscious. I got to be honest with you, because I was I, when the woman is arguing with Darlene Love. Yeah, that's where it I'm, hits. Watch, I'm watching <laughs> that on the monitor and I'm thinking, wait a second. This is kind of like Catherine O'Hara. And <laughs> yeah. and there were and it's instinct. I wish I could say I planned it out, but it was an instinctual. It, it didn't, you know, hurt that we were shooting a scene that's set in 1990, the same year Home Alone was shot. So yeah. all of the wardrobe is exactly the same. You know, the, even down to the coat the woman is wearing is pretty close to what Catherine O'Hara was wearing. So I got a lot of Home Alone vibes when I was shooting that scene on the day. 
I don't know if it's nostalgia or what, but it, even just like watching everyone in that clothing, it felt more believable to me almost um, than watching like some of these modern films. I don't know. It was just a really, it was a delight to just be transported back kind of to that time. And then that really quiet scene uh, between Darby um, and the other character, um, which almost felt like a Ferris Bueller homage to me a little bit. I thought it was going that direction at the beginning, just because of some of the staging with the, the Charlie Sheen character. Right. I uh, no, I, I mean, that again, the problem is when you're around for, you know, I've been doing this for th almost 35 years. And the funny thing is so some stuff just gets in your DNA and you <laughs> yeah. see a movie and you forget the movie, but you may not forget the shot or how the shot was set up. You may mm -hmm. not forget, you know, and you're inspired by, you know, you're inspired by something you saw 30 years ago and you're not even aware of it. You know, it's like, um, uh, I think it's like Springsteen once said, you know, you steal from the best, you know, maybe it was Scorsese, I don't know, but uh, I just, uh, you know, and unconsciously you steal. So um, yeah, that scene, it's one of the scenes I'm most proud of in the movie because those two kids, as I said earlier, I didn't, I, I mean, I really, it was delicate directing because they were yeah. both so good. I mean, I saw Sonny, uh, the, other, the other actor in the scene in Jonah Hill's movie, uh, yeah, you know, mid '90s, and I was just great taken that. with his performance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, the the title is Christmas Chronicles Part Two. Is there a Part Three, a Part Four? Are you guys talking about how this could, you know, be a potential franchise with more Kurt Russell as Santa Claus stories? I think it's a matter of, you know, I th I th I think quite honestly, it's a matter of how this performs on Netflix at this point. There's a great. It's so great to wake up on Christmas morning and uh, Thanksgiving morning and not have to worry about box office and, you know, <laughs> and it was really, I, I miss going to a theater. Don't get me wrong. And we have a theatrical release. Christmas Chronicles opens tomorrow in 60 theaters, but a lot of those just got shut down today because of COVID. Yeah. So I don't know how many people are going to get to see it in a the theater. It's a wonderful experience. I mean, I got to see it once in a theater. I did everything in post-production in this room. Uh, and everything from recording the score to, to doing visual effects to mixing the movie. So when it finally was completed, I went to a stage in Hollywood, got a COVID test and saw it in Atmos, the sound. Oh, wow. And I was just, I, I, I was, it was melancholy because I thought no one's going to get to see this. No one can see this like this. I mean, yeah. you can have a really great television system and a, and a really good sound system at home, pretty inexpensively these days go to Costco and it's close, but it's not the same as being in a movie theater. So uh, there's a little melancholy with that, but there's nothing better than getting up on Thanksgiving morning, turning on a few TVs and your movie's playing on every TV. And then you realize, <laughs> wait a second, Netflix, it's playing on every TV around the world. And that's fun. That is just pure joy for a filmmaker knowing, oh, you can watch this whenever you want it. You know, it's like going back to Horror of Dracula for me. It's like, yeah, I couldn't watch that whenever I wanted. I had to wait until it got on TV. And now, you know, it's there, it's out there forever, which is great. Well, my final question for you, I have to go. Uh, I mean, you've done uh, fantasy, you've done musical, you've done, uh, you know, Christmas movies. Is there a genre you're dying to tackle? Do you want to do a straight, like, do you want to do a down and dirty horror film, like a Hammer film? I don't know. You know, I've been, I mean, part of what I've been doing over the last couple of years is as uh, you know, I have a production company called Maiden Voyage that helps first time filmmakers um, realize their dream of, you know, we help them find financing and we're executive producers on the film and I help them if they need any advice or anything along the way. And we've made eight films already. We did the last picture that was out was uh, or two pictures ago was the lighthouse with Eggers. Uh, yeah. So and we did The Witch as well with, with Rob. And th th thank you for that. That scared me to death. I saw it at Sundance and didn't know it was a horror film. I was just reading the log line and it scared me to death. So. It scared. The, when I saw the first cut, I saw it literally in an office. Sunlight was pouring in and not on a particularly good television. It was probably a 32 inch screen with my two kids. And I was petrified. I was like, this is the birth of a really great director. Yeah. And, but anyway, Eggers and I talk about horror all the time and he's got, we're doing enough, he's off doing a Viking film now where that we're not involved with, but he's, uh, we've got a horror film that we want to do together. So uh, I won't be directing it though. So, but it's pretty hammer-esque and down and dirty. Um, but I, you know, I think 
part of me really wants to do that. And I don't know what it is, but I don't know what that film would be yet, but yeah, I would love to, maybe it's gremlins three, who knows? Yeah. Well, I'd love to see it. Thank you so much for giving me so much of your time. Congratulations on the film. Uh, and as I said, congratulations on your career thus, thus far. Adam, thank you. So, thank you so much. Thanks for saying all those nice things. <laughs>